Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, or at least we try to be professional at most of the time. We've all illustrated uh, children's books for all the major publishers. We've published somewhere around 50 or 75 books together, and we've all taught illustration in art schools. Each week we come at you guys with a fantastic new topic in the field of illustration. Sometimes we argue, sometimes we agree, but each time you're gonna learn something brand new. Sounds good. Lee, you were just saying you have something you wanted to, to talk about. Right. Yeah, this is, test, or? It's just tangentially, tangentially related to illustration. So we're <laughs> storytellers, right? Right. I mean, that we deal with story. It's funny because our, our, I guess our job is drawing, but really our job is storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is an interesting little distinction. If it, and, and it's funny to start thinking yourself that way. So I saw, a movie. you know, I, we, we went into Jake's movie rating system a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right. I guess it'd be a couple of months ago, depending on when this podcast comes out, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it just drives me crazy when stories are not taken to their potential. And I'm seeing a bunch of movies that in the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I kind of, you know, go into my storytelling mode as an illustrator. And I think to myself, okay, here's the premise. You know, they built this thing and then they totally wreck it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think it's, a, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. It's American cinema. The mm -hmm. movie I'm thinking of is, it's an older film. So I'm not going to give any spoilers away. Okay. Hancock. Did you see it with Will Will Smith? Oh yeah, right. Okay, okay so I actually just, never I never saw it. It's on it's on either Amazon Prime or Netflix, one of those two. And it's, yeah, I saw it's free. It, I saw it on on the on the thing over the weekend, and I was like, oh, maybe I should watch that. I ended up watching. Well, now now I'm going to give you a spoiler, but uh, spoil okay. away. I don't care. It's too, it's too old. To, anyway, if you have, you don't have you don't have to have seen the movie to. Uh, to get my point, my, my, the premise of this movie, which I thought was so good, is you have somebody who has amazing, like Superman level abilities. He right. has no flaws, apparently. Um, can fly, can you know stop a train if it hits him. That's one of the scenes. It's pretty amazing special effects. Um, but he's deeply flawed personally. Mm -hmm. and he's got a lot of pain. He's got a lot of baggage, a lot of pain. He's like a, he's sort of a drunk. He's, he's, he's aggressive. He, he misuses his powers, even though he sort of reluctantly saves people. Yeah. <clears throat> and then enter, uh, what's his name? Jason Bateman, Re <laughs> regular perfect, guy. Yeah, he's good. He, he, I love, yeah. I love him anyway, especially from Arrested Development. He's great. But he comes in and starts, uh, you know, basically trying to help Will Smith's character, Hancock. And 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 turn his life around, get get back in the in the good of the public eye, and where I thought it was going for the first forty five minutes is you have a you have a flawed superhero, which is great. Like normally in a superhero movie, the superhero saves the regular guy, but in this one, the regular guy is set. The setup is the regular guy is going to save the superhero. Yeah, so beautiful setup. Weak. Beautiful set. Like it's, it's almost perfect. And I was like, okay, so, so how it's going to play out is, you know, he's going to have to go over trials and tribulations trying to, you know, Will Smith, just like any addict or something like that is going to have some relapses and, and, you know, come to terms with who he is and what his role is on, you know, in the world and saving people and all that. And then it was like in 45 minutes, an hour in all of a sudden they, it becomes American cinema. They are like, Oh my God, this is not enough of a setup. And they set up this just, explosion kind of, of, of a story. They just throw this curveball at the story, <laughs> mm -hmm. add all this other superhero stuff. And this, I mean, just a ridiculous storyline when they had the perfect storyline going. And I just like, I was just rolling my eyes as I was sitting on the couch watching it. Like, Oh my God. Okay. I got another hour of this. And now, now it becomes, what was that movie? Do you remember the one with um, Angelina Jolie and, and um, Brad Pitt where they're yeah. sort of Mr. And Mrs. Smith. They set that up as, as like now there's a female superhero and they're battling and it becomes this like huge scale like there's tornadoes and and <laughs> I was just like God I mean just you it just made something. me mad you it was so something. good yeah you know the iron the Iron Giant is the only one only movie one of the only movies who who just had this perfectly sweet premise and didn't mm -hmm. try to overplay their hand. Mm -hmm. And I just I just noticed it more and more with American cinema. Like the like it seems like the people think 
oh, this simple story is not enough. We need to turn it up. And then all of a sudden it becomes crap. That's probably because probably there's too many hands in it. You know, there's well, just too was, many people. I was going to say, having worked at a movie studio for five years, it was an animation studio, but still being present uh, at meetings where you're talking to the director, you're talking to uh, art director, things like that. And also knowing some of the executives when they would go through, it sounds like there's some executive notes <laughs> saying, hey, you know, this needs to play well to these other five audiences. So you've got to add this gross. character. You've got to add this character. You've got to add mm. this element to it. Uh, it's gross. Uh, yeah. I, I would ultimately say that's one of the beauties of being a children's book illustrator is there, I mean, there is a few hands in the pot, but there's not, there's not many. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you do get those notes sometimes. Like I've, I've received a note that's like, hey, suggestion. Why don't you change the whole way you're illustrating this for this other thing? You know, like, <laughs> so it sells better. <laughs> so we still do take, do get that, but it's not nearly as bad. I, I just keep noticing it in, in cinema lately. They yeah. got a good idea. They just blow it. You know, what we watched over the weekend was uh, My Neighbor Totoro. Have you seen that? <laughs> is that a movie? No, is that, <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We've okay. seen it ten thousand times. Okay, good, good. <laughs> I, some people, it, some people haven't seen it. Some people don't know what you're really? talking about when you bring it up. Yeah. I'm oh serious. my god. If you have friends that aren't into uh, uh, art, <laughs> I'll tell you this. If I had a friend who I said, if I told him I watched that movie, and they're like, "Oh, what's that? I haven't heard of it." I would stop being friends with them. That is an indicator that we don't need to be. Lee, I, I've well, never seen that. I'm constantly making <laughs> I'm constantly making new friends, you know, trying to invite new and different kinds of people into my life. So that's why okay. you know, it's the betting situation. <laughs> Anyways, that there's a movie that doesn't have an antagonist. It doesn't have like a fart joke. It doesn't have like it is just a snapshot of 1950s rural Japan. And like these kids in this family dealing with, it's it has it has such a quiet, peaceful, like sweet movie that has all the fun and you know excitement and fantasy in it as well. I it really it, there is a difference between foreign Japanese cinema and there, there really is. And, did you see? Did you guys see? We'll we'll get to these our illustration questions in, in a second. <laughs> but there's one more thing I want to mention. If you like. Um, if you like that movie, you'll love Letters to Momo if you haven't seen it. Have okay, seen I haven't one? seen that one, no. It, it is as good as, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's as good as almost any of the Miyazaki films, Spirited yeah. Away and all that stuff. I mean, it's along those same lines, quiet, same same idea. They don't, there's no no big giant, oh, I want to rule the world. It's where a lot of American cinema goes, by the way. It's kind of interesting when you look yeah. at it. There's always like a, a mega mind where right? he wants to take over the world. Right. Some of those are funny and they're good too, but I'm just saying it's just, it's just constantly somebody wants to take over everything. Right. You know, and the incredible. You know what's funny is, I, I will say this, we call those movies like Letters to Momo and, and Total We call those Sunday movies in our house. <laughs> like it's a movie you watch on a Sunday. It's easy to <laughs> get you riled up. The kids just want to go to sleep afterwards. <laughs> like it's, it's a That's Sunday perfect. Movie. That's um, perfect. Uh, I was in, so I did this book called Little Bot and Sparrow. It's a ch children's book and it's a sweet, quiet story. It's about a robot who makes friends with a sparrow uh, the sparrow leaves for winter. The robot's like worried they'll never see it again. It's just this nice, sweet thing. And it, it's always really well received by anybody who reads it. And they just, you know, some people have said it's, it's made them cry. And I've had people who have like gotten tattoos it's a good book. of Little Bot on them. Um, will says he likes it. So that it made me cry the first time. Like not, not a lot. Just like <laughs> kind of like, like glistening. No, just glistening eyes. Okay, glistening. good, good. Yeah. Because it is, it, it deals with loss and it deals with, you know, how do you, how do you cope with that? Anyways, my agent was like, Hey, I got a meeting for you with, um, CAA, which is like a big agency in Los Angeles. And I was meeting with one of their animation, um, agents, like one of their, one of their big an animation things. She's like, you should pitch your, your book to them as an animated film. And so I worked on how would I expand this out to be a bigger, a bigger story, bigger animation, uh, you know, a longer thing than just a children's book. And so I came up with this idea, like the sparrow leaves, 
the the robot deals with that, but then something happens where he like has to go and find the sparrow. So he goes on this adventure, and it's almost like um, almost like Pinocchio, where Pinocchio is not trying to like take over the world or stop somebody from taking over. The world. He's just he's just like you know trying to like live his life, and then Geppetto, you know, needs to be rescued, so he goes to rescue Geppetto. Right? And it's like it's 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 cool. It's sweet. And, uh, and so I'm pitching this story and they're like, this is really good, cool images. You know, you've got a lot of like fun and adventure in this, but you have to have some bad guy who's trying to take over something that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and I was like, no. what, really? They're like, yeah, yeah. No. Go work on it. Come back to us when you figure it out, you know, it, he needs to be stopping some like existential threat. That's like either going to take over the world or at least his forest that he's in. <laughs> I was just like, I it really, I, I never went back. I never worked on it. <laughs> I was like, I was just so like, like it just put this bad taste in my mouth. Um, that said, I think they do have a point. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But um, they do try it, to it, ramp it up. I've, I've submitted a manuscript about a kid who wants to set a world record. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a, uh, it was just going to be this like sort of absurd, like basically my my goal in it was just to draw all these cool shots of a kid trying to set dumb world records. You know, how yeah. world records are so stupid, like st- stacking teacups or something like that. And it was just this cute kind of slice of life story about this kid who had this idea. And and it it and the notes I got back where I needed to add a bully, like that's somehow he's trying to set the world record to somehow thwart a bully. <laughs> It just gotta, make, gotta, bullies are hot right now. <laughs> no sense to put a bully in there. It seems so. Bullies are are so well. Hot. The, and you know, I think a lot of what's happening in publishing now is that they're trying. They they have to have in their pitch meetings. They want to have a you know this book solves this problem. This book, you know what I mean. It's not just a happy story. It th- there's all these selling points with it, and mm-hmm. as I think. I think it's misguided ultimately because I think a lot of times when a mom and or a dad and a, and kids want to roll up with a book, they just want to be entertained. They just want to right, enjoy well, that time. I'm going to, I'm going to push back on that. Ready for this? I think what's going on here. So who buys children's books? Parents, Parents and librarians, right? Mm-hmm. Who are the, they're the gatekeepers, right? And, and the gatekeepers to them are, um, the uh, the distributors right the so so when you when a when a children's book is being made the publisher takes it and says here's the books that we're coming out with and the distributors who you know send the books to all the bookstores and and you know decide okay we know what parents and librarians are wanting so we're going to take this and this I think we we're, we're living in a, a culture or a climate right now where people are a little if if they're either lost or they're so firm in their beliefs that um there can't be room for something that doesn't reinforce certain beliefs right Mm -hmm. and so i think what you're going to find is uh, and what we have been finding is parents want to be able to have something that they can teach their kids something with right or these gatekeepers are wanting to have something that they can teach a, a lesson learned, something didactic a little bit, maybe not too on the nose, but, but in some cases, yes, very on the nose. And so I, what I think you're seeing here is they're making those, those choices. You still have a, a large section of the pop, populace who do just want to be entertained, but they're getting that from animation. They're getting it from video games. They're getting it from like these other things, which, maybe don't have an overarching like um you know like message that really is being driven home like you might have in in some of these more contemporary children's books so do you know what i say to that i say let the market decide if you want to make children's books that are driving home a strong um you know belief or message or something like that and it's not just entertainment value it's not just cat in a hat which I mean, it teaches reading skills, but it, you know, it's also saying, you know, don't lie, don't cheat or whatever moral you're trying to do. And it's very heavy handed. Hey, if they sell, if they sell well, 
why why not do it right the problem is the gatekeeper though doesn't let that book get made you're saying yeah, let the so, audience decide but so well here's here's the flip side to that you also have um more than ever you have these opportunities to self-publish and to reach an audience that um that doesn't feel like they're being uh, catered to by mm-hmm. traditional publishers. So if if your goal is to make something um, that the traditional publishers aren't interested in, but you know there's an audience for, go find that audience. You've got all the tools. Right. Yeah. You, in some cases, you have better access to these these people because you have a different mindset than than some of the publishers too. So like that's why I think publishing is going to die. Traditional publishing. I'm going to put it out there. Is going to die. Mm. They're too reactionary. They're trying to guess. Well, or transform. It's not going to die. It's it'll transform. Nope, it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you know anything I mean, about traditional publishing, it, it, it's been a very rocky road these last five years, and this mm-hmm. pandemic has been a killer for a lot of publishers because they rely on, especially Scholastic, they rely on school uh, book sales, book fairs, right? yeah, book fairs, right. And that's that was a huge hit for mm-hmm. a lot of publishers because there were no no book fairs this last. Right. I mean, if if a market isn't being satisfied, it just creates new markets. So, mm-hmm. and however it's satisfied, it's going to be satisfied either through um, indie publishing or through other. Um, I mean, uh, someone who starts out as an indie publisher who become who goes more mainstream because of their success. So, right, I see that as. That's what will, that's the natural consequence or the natural result, maybe not a consequence, but the natural result is that um, demand will drive the, the, the um, supply. You want to know how to hit a, a home run doing this? Make a children's book that serves a community that has very strongly held like beliefs Mm -hmm. so um so if you made a children's book that catered really like really well to the blm movement or on the flip side you made a children's book that was like police are our friends (laughs) i'm trying to be you know play both sides here um uh i i guarantee you'd find an audience you'd build a facebook page for that and 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 you know but i don't know if that does anything to help (laughs) any of our situation it doesn't bring people right. together it it just divides us more well but, in some ways it does there there are other there are many niche markets out there um, yeah yeah like, like the uh, farting dog books right so that yeah. you know that was a little too lowbrow for for new york publishers so they went and kind of did it on their own right if i if i know if i it went yeah and it went crazy it went crazy because it served the lowbrow market mm-hmm. who's like we don't have any children's books that that serve us. They're all about, you know, mm-hmm. patty cake and being friends. Um, we need one that about a farting dog. Same, same with uh, books that on with uh, children that have specific diseases. Mm-hmm. Um, parents would love to get a book for their kid who's suffering with diabetes. You know, type one diabetes. Yeah, yeah. So. that's true. And and there's there's so many kids I know now who um, who have autism. Mm-hmm. Like any sort of book that would help a family, uh, uh, you know, feel like like that served, you know, served what they're dealing with, or or that lifestyle that they're that they're experiencing, mm-hmm. that would that would do well too. Yeah, huh. sure. Lee, you started us with Hancock. <laughs> I don't know how we ended up. Sorry. I mean, that was like, a, we're on 20. We're going to 20 minutes now. I, I didn't mean for it to be that that much of a detour, but uh, but right. I like I like that conversation. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I can't wait to see what kind of emails we're going to get um, <laughs> from that. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. First question comes in from, where are we? Where are we? Emily. Emily. Her uh, subject line is to be or not to be the style conundrum. I'm confused about what to do with my style, as I'm sure many illustrators are. I have often heard from you guys and others that you should look at the trends if you want to get work. I have also been told that my work is quite distinctive 
And maybe I should do other styles to get more work. Granted, I am in New Zealand, so there's a limited children's book. So there is limited children's book illustration work. Then I have my own thoughts where half of me feels that if I do what everybody else does, I'm not being very creative and maybe selling my soul a little bit. And the other half of me feels I should just do what makes what it takes to get work. Have you guys had have you guys had these conflicts in your illustration careers and how did you solve it? So do you do this the the trendy style that everybody's doing to get work? Or do you do the style that you feel most comfortable in, but maybe not be trendy and try to get work that way? Will you get work that way? What do you guys think? Well, I have some specific thoughts about this. I, I think there's two different types of people. There's some people that say they want to do children's books, but nothing in their portfolio remotely resembles work that would be done for children's books. So, for, um, for example, they don't have any cute kids mm. in their portfolio or cute animals. And it's like, there are, within within the confines of the children's book world, I mean, like, if you, if you, if you take, go from fine art all the way over to tattoos and everything in between, right? And children's books fits in there. You're going to, you're going to find that there's a, you know, anything goes. And, but if you, if you narrow it down to, uh, the parameters of a children's book, you're, there are certain things that you can do and there's certain things you can't do. If you don't like drawing cute animals, cute kids, you probably won't do well. There's not too many books that don't, and, and cute is subjective. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you, if you are, if, if this person that we're talking to right now, Emily, you know, if she's drawing cute kids and she's listening to this and she's saying, yeah, but yeah, but I, my stuff doesn't look like the current stuff that's being published. I would say go, go to your local bookstore. And I mean, the styles are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I mean, like, like one of the things that I, I did is, um, you know, I had, I had my really um, re highly rendered colorful style. And then I had this uh, modified kind of cross hatching drawing style, and and I like both of them, but they were both very very different, but also had quite a few similarities. And and I could add color to my drawing style that was mimic the the color, but in a much more limited usage. And uh, one day, um, Martha Rago, who's a, who was at the time the creative director um, of Penguin Publishing which is now Penguin Random House. And um, she, she said, well, you know, we were at a conference and she said, I, I would really love to use your, your more limited style. Do, have you ever done any, any books with that? Well, I had done a self-published book with that. So she's like, well, send me some samples of that. And uh, you know, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. And it was like two years later that, that uh, she finally found the manuscript Bonaparte falls apart and gave that to me. And, in, but was very specific about using this other style. So I wouldn't, I, one, one thing that I wouldn't do is, is just try to follow trends, but within you, I bet you, you have um, some modifications that you can make that you still really like right now. I love both of my styles equally. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't care which one I work in. I love, I love working in both of them. And um, I think that you probably if if I were listening to this and I felt like my work was dated or the style wasn't popular, quote unquote popular, whatever that means, um, I, I think a good game plan is to is to look at three to five books that you would think are popular that you love. I mean, you have to love them mm -hmm. and kind of kind of meld those styles together somehow to create your own unique take on what's happening today because you, you you can't look like um i mean you can't you can't really you pr probably would have a hard time selling a a pd eastman style you know or or looking just like uh, dr seuss or something that's it's mm -hmm. got this super you, you know i mean back in the day that was popular mm -hmm. well it's not today yeah, no. but it, I think if you want to do a, a retro style, you have to bring something contemporary to right. it. Mm -hmm. So let's say you do Dr. Seuss, but but you 
you draw very contemporary like environments with it or something Mm -hmm. like that you know well you're doing that aren't you with uh cc and benson yeah cc and benson yeah yeah a little bit like i have this inking style that i've i've done i've done 11 children's books um and i've between those children's books i've done kind of two different styles um, there's my more rendered pencil-ish color render style. And then there's my hard ink line style that I do, which is, you know, some people said it's Susian uh, about it. Um, and uh, and really the reason I go one or the other, it depends on the what the book needs and what the, really what the art director wants. But the reason that I've been able to transition between the two is I have enough like I guess style credibility that I can do that for an entire book. So Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'll show them, here's a character test. Here's a a illustration spread test uh, in this style. So they could see it and they can catch the vision. Oh yeah. This guy can, can do this whole book in this style. And that's how I've been able to switch between those two styles. Um, But like, my rendered soft style wouldn't work for 12 slaves of Christmas because that style is all about like intricate vehicles and, you know, the elves kind of cartoony elves and, um, and it doesn't need to be soft and like impressionistic. But it it could, it could be, I mean, that's a judgment call too. Like I think of that, that book, uh, is it the elves book that we were talking about a while back? Um, Oh, gnomes gnomes right 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 yeah i can see that book done in that style and oh it's yeah yeah way different yeah a lot of detail that's true that's true i, th- so, I, th- I think you can shift it i mean i i th- I'd, I'd say you need to look at what your style is and then look at what's popular and then think not just like oh i'm going to copy that new popular style but why are people responding to that style mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then if you can break that down is it is it an energy in the mark making is it is it a, a different kind of compositional element. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you just got to sort of analyze it and then you can interpret those things into what you're doing. And that way you're not just like, well, okay, I guess my style has to look like this person. You know, you're not just following them exactly mm-hmm. what they're doing. But that's the way to do it. I mean, the other thing that I think about, and I just want to run this, this theory by you guys. I think what's happened now with the style that's happening now, it's a little bit more naive. It's kind of more in my wheelhouse, luckily. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm glad that it, leaned that way because <laughs> it's just what i do naturally but but this sort of it's naive kind of style, folksy right yeah a little bit yeah it's it's definitely not so technical in terms of drawing skill and, and rendering and all mm-hmm. that stuff i think why it works for kids books and who knows if it'll change again but if you're it, we, we've all had kids you guys know what it is if you go to a park with a kid they don't care about the adults the second they see a kid their, you know, their vision is just trained on that kid. They just want to play with that kid, right? It's the same thing with art. When kids see art, I think they, they, if you put Chris Van Allsburg, you have a five-year-old, you have put, put a Chris Van Allsburg image and a, a no David from David Shannon mm-hmm. image up and say, which one do you like better? I think the kid responds to the one that's more similar to the mark making that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the adults buy Chris Van Allsburg. Not that kids don't like it, of course. I mean, he's incredible. And right. you look at the people that are doing realistic art who who will always get a book, David Wiesner. I mean, do you think people aren't going to hire David Wiesner? But then you look at, okay, how is he getting work and doing this technically accurate, uh, you know, real world kind of drawing stuff? It's that he's brought a sense of fantasy and a sense of magic to his work that works really well for children's books he's not just like oh i'm a, I'm a rendering guy i'm a realistic guy and i want to do kids books he brought an interest to the kids and so i guess that would be my question mm-hmm. if somebody has a style that's not currently used in children's books is how do i make this interesting for that market yeah i would love to see a some kind of a poll where you where you bring in a thousand kids and you have them pick a book between Chris Van Allsburg and David Shannon. Because I, I I don't know. When I was a kid, I loved the more highly but, rendered stuff. But you also, the people making the decisions are editors and art directors who oh, are, yeah. I haven't met any who are kids. Um, they're all, they're all adults. The Did you see the movie Big? Oh, right. That's After right. That. I forgot about that. That, that could happen. <laughs> Magic at work there. Um, yeah, but and so so now you're playing with what do these adults think a kid 
would respond to as well. Correct. Well, and I don't even think they're thinking that. I think they're they're mostly following. Most of the art directors are have have basically adopted their aesthetics from what's already out there. It's like a we're all afraid to stick our neck out. Let's face it, you know, like yeah, so most beginning art directors are going to try to fit in. Mm-hmm. And they're going to try to select illustrators that they think they won't get any pushback, you know, because their mm-hmm. reputation is on the line when they choose somebody. If they choose somebody that is totally out there and totally different and they, they really fight for them, they're risking a lot. Because if the if the committee goes <laughs> when they leave the room, like what's up with with, with so and so? That's like, a good I point. I thought they had a good, good taste. They didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's they're, they're chasing their own tail. Here's here's, here's what I say. Point. Here's the here's the definitive answer to this question. <laughs> the definitive to, answer. Give it to us, <laughs> You ready for this? <laughs> Follow opportunity if you want to get work and bring your passion along with you. And that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of a. Uh, I think it's Mike Rowe who originally said that. Don't follow your passion. Follow opportunity, but bring passion with you. Mm-hmm. So. If there's an opportunity right now to become a children's book illustrator and there is a particular range of styles that people are looking for, then I would make a portfolio that that fits in that spectrum of styles. And you've got Chris Van Allsburg on one side, who who I don't know if we should mention him because when was his last children's book? You know, (laughs) I don't, he's not, I mean, his books still sell, but who's doing. Chris Van Allsburg type work on one end. I don't know, but go to a, go to a children's book store. Um, also known as a bookstore that has a children's book <laughs> section and, uh, and look at that spectrum and see where you fit in and see what you can do to fit into that um, by still, but still keep what you love about illustrating with it, have it be an element of whatever that you're doing so that you are making something that fits but also is is still genuine to you, right? So like I look at Lee's style, I'm jealous of it, I love it. I look at Will's style, I'm jealous of it, I love it. And these two guys don't have similar styles. They're both getting jobs doing illustrating children's books. I'm getting jobs illustrating children's books and my style is different. But if I were to try to do Lee's style, I think it would come off as as me trying to do Lee style. And if I were to render <laughs> color like Will try to do that, it would come off as me like trying to do Will style. So I'm sort of here in my wheelhouse doing my thing, but I still have uh, a style or two styles here that I think fit within what what uh, is acceptable for, for Jones Publishing. Mm. Do you I guys think, remember... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Will. I was just going to say, I think... Chris's last book was The Misadventures of Sweetie Pie, 2014. Mm. I could so be wrong. Seven years ago. It's what hard. It's really hard to get down to the studio when you have to like swim through piles of cash. And, like, <laughs> like, screwed, you you probably can't duck. even find his studio <laughs> to make art because it's just stacks of, of Polar Express royalty checks all over the place. <laughs> Well, do you guys remember there was a, a, you know, there's, there's always something out of left field too. Like uh, what was the book? I don't, I don't know what year it was a couple years back. Oh, it was called the house in the night. A call to cut winning book um, by Beth crumbs or chrome. Crumbs. Yeah. Crumbs. You know, it was, it was, a, her. you know, it's like, it's like a woodcut style. I don't know if she's doing that digitally or, tr- or traditionally, but it was just out of the, out of nowhere you know what i mean like no there's not like oh that's the style that people are working in it was it's way different than anything out there it's gorgeous and it you know and she has a place in children's books with that style it's not traditional it's not popular i would say but um and definitely her it's definitely her own uh yeah so, looking you know, at right now room. it's like scratch scratch board Style? Yeah, it looks like yeah, it looks like that. Not yeah, not woodcut, but scratchboard or something like that. It almost looks like a print, some kind of printmaking style. Yeah, and it, it's just just not a lot out there that that looks like that. There's not a lot of precedent for that, and yet somehow this person not only did a children's book, but won the Caldecott for doing it. So it's a it's a it's a tricky balancing act because you know do you do you 
are you on the side of of this person of of Beth where you're you know you're doing the right thing and then you're you might win the call to cut or are you trying to hold your style and it's not good for children's books and you're just like you know gonna fight your own fight yourself in that struggle I guess well, I don't know it's tough and here's the thing too like it'd be awesome to win a Caldecott but um I I keep coming back to this idea, like, why do you run, why, why does a person run marathons? Is it because they like medals? They like receiving medals? No, they just like running. Right. So if you're getting into this, you, you like illustration, you like the act of making a book, you like seeing a project from start to finish, whether you get an, an award or not, shouldn't matter. Shouldn't be the point of it. Um, I, I know the Caldecott is sort of like this, you know, you can kind of take the temperature of what people are into, but I know there's so many artists, illustrators, writers who have amazing careers in children's books that will never get a Caldecott, right? Just they, they don't make Caldecott books, but they make books that sell well. They make books that pay their bills um, and they, and they enjoy doing it. So so that's another thing too to think about. It's like, do you do you want to win an award and 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 be like at the top of the thing, but also being being very competitive, and you know competing against ten thousand books, you know that year, or are you interested in, um, um, you know, just making your book the best that you can make it, and and get that next book deal and get that next book deal, as well. You guys know I'm going to win the Caldecott this next year, right? You have to have a book come out. <clears throat> I did. <laughs> oh, okay. 2020. 20, oh, that's this right. Pretty, that's right. This, this pretty, pretty planet. planet. I filled out a huge, huge, like little you please form. Please, so you can give yeah. this podcast some credibility. <laughs> I, I've sent all kinds of cash to the people who I think are the judges. I don't know for sure. <laughs> So I'm trying to bribe my way in, but I'm going to win. <laughs> All right. Did we answer this question for Emily? Emily, I'm so sorry that we took your question and did this. <laughs> no, that was, I thought that was a good, I thought that was a good discussion. I don't know. They're like, do we answer yes anyone's answer, question? Guys. Next question is like, please, yes, yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Joshua writes in super witty subject topic is his subject line. Okay. Interesting. Good one, Josh. <laughs> He says, after the journey of learning what spot illustration is or more what accurately what it is not, what are some of your guys's, your guys's, is that even a word? Your guys? guys in the is. South, oh, in the, guys. that's a tough one to plural guys you guys. Is. In the South, we say y'all. That just okay. Cut. What are some of y'all's favorite illustration <laughs> techniques or layouts? What's your favorite illustration techniques or layouts? What, what's a layout or an illustration technique that you come back to all the time? So composition, is that what they're talking about? I think composition, layout. One of the, can I, can I go first? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. One of the things that I love about, and I'm, I'm going to apply this to children's books, is early on in my um, children's book career, I really struggled with not having backgrounds in every image. You know, like I just, I couldn't see, I couldn't see in terms of, of uh you know letting the background just fade into white space i just mm -hmm. it just i couldn't figure out right what to, to do it. Yeah. what to put there and what to and how to fade it out and what to bring in and what not do and i ended up um just buying tons of books of children's books where they were really good at that um david catro one of my favorite illustrators is really really good at that and and allowing you know, not not having backgrounds competing with focal point, not having backgrounds that over explain things or that that take you out of the story mm -hmm. that that add extra things. So I would say a, a technique that I really love is a really good spot illustration that tells the story without without going too far. Mm. I'll add to that. I call it the playset technique. I like to have names for most of the techniques. If, you're, okay, if you've ever studied with me, like we have some of my students listening in that I've taught at school. And uh, I used to always name all this stuff, perspective techniques, composition techniques, and just gave people something to grab onto. Mm -hmm. um, and so the playset technique is, is it's sort of elaborating on what Will's saying. And that is, I, I struggled with that too. And I think 
when you're first an illustrator, depending on where you're coming from, too, if you're coming from photography or, or a realistic kind of drawing background, you almost view the pages as being like a window, right? Like mm -hmm. you're looking into a real world and everything's in it, right? Mm -hmm. You're just kind of moving this window around and everything right. exists. But the way I was able to let go of that idea is to think of it like a play. And you think of like, like a set that go, goes on to a, goes with a play. It's only a certain pieces that come in. It's not a full city scene, you know, or, 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 or you know, the, the countryside for Rome, uh, Romeo and Juliet with the tower and all that stuff. It's not everything. It's just the balcony and like four trees. And it's like, right. okay, that's, en that's enough. And so that enabled me, like basically you're a, a set designer and you can move these pieces interchangeably. And that also f is what flattened out my art too, because I thought of these shapes basically overlapping themselves instead of going back into deep space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's really cool. I'd say my one of my favorite illustration techniques is the peg leg pig method. <laughs> I've heard so much about this peg leg pig lately. It's also <laughs> called the one fin shark. But go ahead, Jake. The, the one fin shark. <laughs> uh, the no fin shark. Right, no, I don't know. Sure. peg leg pig. Just briefly, <laughs> and if you've taken our children's book pro course, you already know about this. But um, it's essentially what's the difference between a drawing and an illustration? And people get, you know, this is really what divides illustrators from artists, and that is a drawing is just an image. An illustration is an image that tells a story. So. You know, when you are doing life drawing, that you're doing life drawing, not life illustration, right? When you're doing a portrait, you're doing a portrait, not an illustration. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you add any sort of story element to it, you're now illustrating. And so I call it the peg leg pig because there's this, this old bad joke where um, this guy's driving through the countryside. He's driving along, he passes his farm, and he notices a pig in the pig pen and it's got a peg leg. And he's like, huh. And he keeps thinking about it. And eventually curiosity like gets the best of him. And he pulls a U-turn, goes back, knocks on the door. Why on earth do you have a pig with a peg leg, right? <clears throat> and so if you draw a picture of a pig, you know nothing about that pig. There's, It's just a drawing. But if you take an element like a peg leg and stick it on a pig, all of a sudden the viewer is like, wants to know what's going on. What's the question? You know, what, how did that pig lose the leg? How did he, um, you know, what did he, what led up to this? What is going to happen after this? And so if you can add any sort of element like that to your drawing or your illustration, you're going to make every page in your, um, in your book so much better and so much more interesting because the person looking at it is going to just want to, ask questions. The words are going to fill in some of the gaps, but the illustration is going to like want them to turn the page or want them, you know, build out that world even more. I think about like Will's um, uh, Bonaparte book. If you go to like the first page, he showed an example in one of the videos that we made um, where he needed to show that this, this skeleton's falling apart. And just the process that you shared of what what do you show to show that like the skeleton can't keep himself together, this character, mm -hmm. the skeleton character. And the idea that you came up with was to have his head. He's searching for his head, but then to also have a basketball in the room, that's like the peg leg so that you, there's like a little, there's like a joke happening there. It's like, he's going to find the basketball, stick it on his body and realize that's not my head. That's the kind of thing that you have to add to each one of your illustrations just to make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more fun. Chris Van Allsburg also does a fun thing in his children's books. And he has this, I don't know if the dog's still alive, but he had this, this little white terrier dog, Jack Russell or something like that. And he's Oh, that's, that that's David Shannon. Oh, is that David Shannon? Yeah. Well, I think Allsburg also did the, the white dog too. If you look in oh, these really? books, there's a, there's a dog. Maybe both of them. I don't know. But people David, sneak, David sneaking Shannon stuff definitely in there. Has. Yeah. yeah. Just just fun little little things uh, to do. So those are some of some of the techniques. I think that to go along with that, th think about your everyday life. And when you see something weird and it makes you question, like you see a group of people looking up. Have you ever been 
you know, you're, you're driving down the road and you see a whole group of people like looking up at the sky and you start wondering or up on the mountain, like, yeah, what, what are they looking at? What are they looking at? So it creates a, it creates a question. And uh, we were at the park the other day and there was a guy who was taking measurements with, with like a survey um, thing. And, but it was weird. And he kept looking at his phone. He kept doing this thing with this new device that I had never seen. And then his phone. And I'm like, that guy is either preparing a bomb to be dropped in a certain place or like we were sitting there eating our lunch <laughs> and there was four of us and we were all like trying to figure out what is he doing? And since no one could come up with it, I'm like, I'm just going to go ask him. Mm-hmm. I, just, I, I, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I, I'm confident enough that I can just go. And he's like, Oh, we're going to be completely renovating this part of the park. There's going to be all these new improvements and everything. And it was cool to, to bring that information back to the table and like, well, what do you guys think it is? And, you know, and there's still, I know exactly what he's doing, you know, and, and that's as an illustrator, I think you have to have that kind of mindset when you're approaching an illustration is what can you add that goes beyond the text that is also not distracting, but that enhances the text. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can't, sometimes there are, there are illustrations that are just fillers. They're get you from point A to B continue yeah. the story you um, guys know what the MacGuffin is yeah <laughs> MacGuffin. That's, what that, <laughs> that's what that reminds me. what is it jake give it it's, a good so it's a term question. that i believe um um what's his face the guy that directed psycho um um and the hitchcock? birds yeah, alfred hitchcock i think he came up with it but he said you know you need a MacGuffin, and a MacGuffin is something that doesn't matter that is that that is like not important to the actual story but is a reason for the story to happen so like one of the most famous MacGuffins ever is the ark in raiders of the lost ark it is the thing that everybody's curious about wants you know that there's there's searching briefcase and pulp fiction briefcase and pulp fiction um but it it really doesn't matter if it's an ark or if it's a jewel or if it's something to the story it just you know it's interchangeable. It just moves it around. The, the actual definition, uh, when I Googled it, is an object or device in a movie or book that serves merely as a trigger for the plot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Trigger it's for the plot. Yeah. Love that. So do you guys know the punchline to the peg leg pig joke? Have you, have you heard that no. joke before? Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to finish it here. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that there was a formula. There is, actually is a punchline. <laughs> so he asked the farmer... You know why on earth does this pig have a peg leg? And the farmer, you know, his eyes get a little misty. He's like, "Well, I'll tell you. Uh, one night, me and my family were asleep. We hear this banging on the door. I go downstairs. This pig is ramming his head against the door, and I look, and the barn is on fire. And the pig like woke us up, saved us, you know, the barn from a fire. I was like, "Whoa!" So did did the the man's like, "Whoa!" Did he like did he lose his leg in the fire? He's all, "No, no, no." Another time, this pig. I was driving my tractor and I hit the ditch wrong and the tractor fell over on top of me. That pig ran over, burrowed underneath and dug me out, saved my life. Well, did he like did, you know, hurt, injure himself on the tractor? It's like, no, 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 no. So well, how did he lose his leg? He's like a pig like that. You don't eat all at once. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. He's going to call me now. Wow. We should end, we should end right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's <is> too good. <laughs> All right, last question. We have another question. Last question. <laughs> this is um, this is a good one. This is one that we kind of get a lot, and we and we've had um, mm-hmm. actual full episodes on this. But this person wished to remain unnamed. Um, it's titled "A Forty Year Old Pipe Dream," and she says, "I've studied animation and then illustration in my twenties." And tell me if this sounds familiar. When I left art school, I had my portfolio in hand and ready to make my mark in the illustration world. And I got rejected or ignored after all my postcard sending and email campaigns to many companies. Um, I look back on it now and I realize how unprepared my portfolio was as it was a mix of styles and mediums with no focus. And as we were taught in school to prepare your portfolio this way to be able to find more work. So that's kind of a, it's not the, her question, but that's kind of an issue is, um, I mean, I, I hope schools are better about that now, like f- narrowing your focus, but 
a generalist portfolio isn't going to get you work. Yeah. You have to really dive down and make a portfolio. That's and, and schools so are doing a good job by doing that. Mm -hmm. by by exposing you and helping you to to try all these things but when you have an assignment that's like a you know it's like a fashion rendering yeah and then you have like an industrial rendering and then you have an <laughs> illustration it's no one knows no one's going to know what to do with that yeah what do i do with this yeah right um so anyways her question is she's now 40 years old with two small kids no time on her hands um, she, she sent us her Instagram account where she's uploaded sketches. We've actually seen her work in Critique mm -hmm. Arena from time mm -hmm. to time. Mm -hmm. It's really good. She says, I'm not looking for a critique as I know that's a big ass. I would just like to know if you think there's a good base there for me to really go for it and try to begin an illustration career. Is it too late in the game for me? How much body of work do I need to begin to showcase a portfolio? So let's say you're in your 40s. You've got some ability. You definitely have a style to it. You want to know, are you, is it too late to get work as a children's book illustrator? And if not, what do you need to like, get your, get your foot in the door, get in the game? What do you guys, what do you guys say to that? Well, and I, I see the work because we looked at it the other yesterday or the day before. Yeah. I think um, yesterday. Did you see it too, Lee? I, I, I haven't it. seen it. I'll um, just and, send you and I recognized it right away from critique arena and it's there's a lot of really good stuff there and um i would say just as a as a personal favor to specifically which doesn't help a lot of the audience because they're not seeing the work and she wants to remain anonymous but um in general your your focal points are great with when you're doing characters because there's there's that is the focal point and they fall apart when you when you do illustrations your value pattern is seems to be more arbitrary and not um, not as planned. And that's one thing that you need to work on. And if you did fix that, where you, you're you directing your eye traffic to the focal point with value and color and not letting it be, if, you, if you're not doing that by default, it's random. And if you randomly, like, you, like think, of, think of it as the same way as if you're just in an elevator and you just start saying a random word or something. Mm -hmm. people, people are going to like, look over at you like you're crazy. So we, we communicate the same way visually. Um, we either communicate in an organized logical way, or we don't. And if, if you fix that, which is pretty easy to do, if you're aware of it, if you're not aware, you don't know what to be fixed, which is, which unfortunately happens with a lot of people that come through art school because they didn't have teachers that actually taught that. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're completely unaware and they've come through art school, they've got their portfolio. And, and then we look at it and we say, well, you're 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 saying log or tree in the background when you sh should be saying little red riding hood or you know what i mean like you're your yeah. your your focus focuses on the wrong things and they're like it's like in a their mind opens up like oh my gosh i never even knew that and it's like how did you go through art school and not know that but as far as um as far for me as far as are is it too late at 40 years i i go back to the thing of like if there's two things that I'm not seeing that are asked here, one, do you have to make money doing it? Or is it something that you can work on because you love doing it and maybe it can lead to money later on? And I always think that that's, that is the best way to approach art is if you, if you're doing it because you have to make money, then your decisions are always going to be, and your judgments are always going to be clouded by almost always by following and taking on assignments that you don't really want to do that don't really fulfill your soul as an artist. But if you can, if you can make the kind of art that you want, you will influence the world. And you, as long as you are trying to um, get it out there, as I mean, as long as you're actively working on putting uh, projects together and getting them in front of people and, and maybe even self publishing, but, but working on projects, it's it's always amazing to me how that almost always ends up giving someone a career path it, it like or or at least it exposes them in a way that opportunities like you talked about earlier open up you know when you're doing really inspiring work so mm -hmm. did you see it lee yeah i'm looking yeah. at it now i got a couple of couple of thoughts on it you know in terms of the 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 the, the overarching question is she too old of course not 
Like we, we're lucky. We're, we're not professional athletes. I, I almost feel sorry for professional athletes in a way mm -hmm. because the window is so short and all it takes is, you know, uh, uh, getting tackled the wrong way or getting, you know, if you're a soccer player, getting tangled up with somebody else while you're running and your knee gets blown you're and done. then you're all, it's over. But like for us, I mean, I think, I think we actually tend to get better over time because we just have more experience. We've experienced more narratives and stories. We've experienced loss and gain and loss again. And, you know, I think, I think we actually get better. So, so the answer to that question is no, you're not too old. Now looking at the work, I have the specific question I have, not just for her, but a lot of people listening is what, when you say you want to be something, and then I look at your work, it, do those two things line up? And right now, this person has, it's, it's a great one to actually talk about because, you know, she says, I, I want to be a children's book illustrator. And, you know, do, can I do this? And then I look at the work and it's, it's styled like a children's book illustrator. But when I actually look at the work, it's 90% character design and if you take away mm -hmm. some of the prompts that we have at svs contest which we, we do like monthly prompts where there's a narrative sometimes will suggest or it's a specific to a location that you have to draw if we took out those there would not be a single location or story in this it's single characters on a white background so then i then i ask myself do you just want to be a character designer because you're not you're saying one thing you're showing something totally different. Um, now, my advice to somebody like that, if, if you go through your work, any, any listener here, if you go through your work and on Instagram or just in your sketchbook and it's just single characters, there is a easy fix to kind of start gauging your real interest. And that is put another character in the scene because the second you have two characters in the same scene, it does not matter what they're doing. As long as they're in the scene together, there is a relationship that's now been established. Are they strangers? Are they people who like each other but can't show it? Are they people who really are attracted to each other? Do they hate each other? Are they jealous? So, you know, like it, some kind of relationship gets established once another character's in there. And, and then I say your illustrations start to become vastly more interesting and they start becoming stories like we talked about earlier. Right now, this person's a, an artist. They're drawing characters, but they're not telling stories. Yeah. And Good I'm looking point. through it and I see, I see one other illustration way down deep of an environment that's, that gives me like, this gives me hope that this, this person could absolutely be, have the, have the portfolio needed. Yeah. Um, Chop, chops, chops are there. Style is there. They did, but, but, the, and I had this question a lot of times when I was teaching animation students, um, they would Want, say they want to be an animator, but then really, I think they just liked animation. They didn't really want to do that. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong. If you just want to draw characters, there is nothing wrong with just drawing characters. I don't want to force anybody into right. something they I, don't want to do. But and it's okay to be a fan of something and not have to. It, with artists, it's so frustrating because you have, if you're an artist, you, you you usually have the ability to kind of do whatever you want that encompasses visual arts, right? And even to the point of like videography, you know, editing video and stuff like that. Like there's a full range here. If you're a visual person, anything involving visuals, you want to participate in that. And at least that's, that's for me. I'm like, I could animate, I could draw comics. I could do um, vehicle design. I could do this. I could do that. And, and what I've, would have you know these last maybe last decade it's it's me be, being more at peace with it's okay to be a fan of something and not have to like contribute to it mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. know right. i can just absorb it and not have to you know make you know make my mark on that thing so my advice to her would be um if if it is if children's book is a thing that you want to get into and you and i you absolutely have like Lee said, the chops do this. You just need to start building out that portfolio. And so what your portfolio is going to be, I would say take three projects and do um, and do six illustrations for each of these projects. So I see you like um, Little Women. So do six illustrations for Little Women in your style. You know, draw the four sisters. Maybe they're, they're carrying food to, the, you know, the family that, that mm -hmm. needed it on Christmas morning, right? Draw that illustration, draw these different six different scenes and say, this is how I would do little women that shows an art director immediately. Like, Oh, if she could do this for little women, she could definitely do it for this project. 
and then do another, you know, maybe do a classic fairy tale, do six illustrations for a classic fairy tale, and then do six illustrations for your own world, your own characters. Maybe it's a fantasy thing. Maybe it's a, uh, a, a little girl who has an explosive iman- imagination or something like that. You've got 18 pieces plus some character designs plus, you know, a couple other um, graphic design things that you do, like with your plants and styles like that. And you've got a solid portfolio. You put that all on one web page and you can link it. Someone can just link it and look through it really fast. Mm-hmm. You, you're going to get people like knocking on your door left and right. Okay. Yep, perfect. Yeah, this was, this was good. Um, anything else you guys want to add or should we, should we end it there? Let's is this wrap it up. this this well before we do this this theme constantly comes up you know is it too late is it worth it is it that to me that's the question is it worth it and i i think you know we 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 don't have a lot of time here on this planet you should be doing things that make you happy mm-hmm. and the thing is people we are inspired by people who are following and doing the things that they that they love. I mean, like in in any in any sport or any kind of craft, if you see someone that is just doing something because they love it, and you can tell they love it, it's inspiring. Mm-hmm. And 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 it makes people. I mean, if you're out on the street, it makes people want to buy to have a piece of it, something that they can remember if they're if they're a tourist, if they're and and. But the same thing goes for to me for for your art, for children's books. If you want to do children's books, make art for children's books and great things will happen. Either you're going to make your own project and you're going to get it out there to the world, or you're going to be discovered by an art director who's looking for your style. But I believe that you have to be in motion to, to create your career. You have to be working constantly on the thing that you say you want to do. So Jake, your advice is great. Uh, start really making the thing that you want to make and eventually opportunity doors will start to open. Mm -hmm. Good one. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Three point perspective is made possible by SVS learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts and your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. You can find Will Terry's work on his website, um, willterry.com or follow him on uh, Instagram, Will Terry Art. I'm doing this all from memory. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go to Lee White, uh, follow him on his Instagram account, Lee White Illo. And you can follow his work on his website at Lee White Illustration. And my Instagram account is at Jake Parker. And my website is jakeparkerart.com. Um, also this podcast is produced and edited by Daniel Two. go check out his work, Daniel two.co. Um, and just special thanks to him and all that he's doing to, to get this podcast going every week or every other week. Uh, David bro is our producer here at SVS learn. He's also integral to us getting things done. So special thanks to David bro and special thanks to Lisa Fott for getting our social media stuff uh, all taken care of. So thanks to that magnificent team. If you like this episode, uh, go check it out on our forum, svslearn.com. Just click on the forum there. And we've got a, um, we've got a uh, thread in the forum devoted just to this episode. So if there's anything you take issue with or anything that resonated with you, log in over there and, uh, and chime in and let us know what you think. Um, as, as always, we appreciate reviews on iTunes. Um, you know, podcasts live and die by reviews and word of mouth. So spread it around, send one of our episodes to somebody to listen to, leave a review, let us know what you think. And uh, we appreciate it. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Hey, before we go. Yeah. We should talk about something interesting right now so that the time stamp goes longer so that people will actually start, will listen to the end. <laughs> they'll, they'll realize <laughs> hey, this is, this is finishing way yeah. earlier. Yeah. What it says here on the time thing. Okay. Right. What's interesting? Well, so we should all talk about something you're going to do today that's not illustration related. No, not uh-huh. illustration related. Well, my my wife's out of town. So you know what that means. 
That means the kitchen's a mess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pizza boxes everywhere. <laughs> no, what's funny is my kid this morning, we're, we're, you know, we're biking to school. He's, he's 12 and he's like, so when does mom get back? And I said, she'll probably be back by dinner Friday, you know, which is like, a little over 24 hours. And he's all, hmm. I said, well, you want to mo- watch movies all night? He's like, we could probably fit in two movies before she gets home after school <laughs> on Friday. <laughs> Does she listen to this podcast? Nope. Okay, good. The other day she's like, how do I listen to podcasts? Show me on this thing. I, I feel bad. I haven't listened to a single episode. <laughs> of the podcast. Like you do not want to listen to this podcast. <laughs> no. We were driving to South Carolina recently for a vacation. And my mom, we were telling my mom about the podcast. And she's like, Oh, you have a podcast, you know? And and they wanted to listen to it on the trip. Oh no. <laughs> like, no. We are not listening to my own podcast on the trip. I'm not doing that. <laughs> it's awkward. It's awkward. It's kind of weird. I how often do you guys actually listen to these episodes once they're once they're posted? Oh, I listen to to a lot of it. Oh, okay, um, but, but I go on YouTube and I and I want to read the comments, and so it's just playing. Yeah, but I don't listen to the whole thing. Okay, we love like, the comments. Yeah, by the way, we want people to comment, mm-hmm. uh, especially on YouTube. If you guys don't know what we look like and and our our banter, yeah, and my uh, my forearm exercises, you can see those. Yeah, I wore stripes today so that you I blend in with the background. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go for a bike ride in the desert, but I'll tell you a really quick thing that I don't think, I don't know if I told you guys or not, but I was riding like last month on this trail and I needed to do like a little wardrobe enhancement, like mm-hmm. adjustment and stuff. So I got off my bike. Well, my wallet fell out of my pack because I went in there to get some water mm-hmm. and uh, didn't know about it. it. Fell on the ground get back to the truck. Don't notice. Oh no. Get home. Where's my wallet. And I'm like, I'm searching everywhere, but I can't figure out where I could have left it. You know, I'm like going through the dumpster cause we took the trash over to the dumpster and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. no wallet. And it's just like, you know, you're in this in for this insane long ride of trying to re recreate your life. It's the worst. It's, it's the right. worst. Can I go ahead? Did you uh, find it? Well, so anyway, a week goes by and I'm like, I'm calling my bank. Like maybe somebody found it and turned it in. Cause I had a bank, you know, my bank cards and stuff, nothing. And then I get this, this text from a police officer. And, mm-hmm. and what had happened was some good Samaritan who didn't even live in this area um, was riding and found it and turned it into the police station. But the police were trying to contact me and they ended up, finding my business partner, Wayne, who then gave him my number. And anyway, I drove down to their police station and got Now, it. did you, do you offer reward there? I don't know what etiquette is there. I asked him and he's like, mm, we don't, you can't give us anything, but you can give it to him. And he gave me the guy's number mm. and stuff. Were you so, wondering why there was like, why all these charges to Dunkin' Donuts on your <laughs> <card>? <laughs> So are you going to reward him? What do you do there? Um, I should. I just uh, now see now. I feel bad now that I like. I was gonna do something and then I didn't. Dude, you should do something. Here's the. I here's should. why I say that. I I found a wallet. I was riding my bike and I found a wallet. And I when I got to to work, I I, I called him immediately, and made an effort to get in touch with this person. You know, it's a little bit of work sometimes to get in touch mm-hmm. with somebody. Got in touch with him. He was so thankful. Came by. Then he said he was gonna give me a war a reward. And he was going to send it to me. And then he never sent it to me. Now, I always uh, think about that. Like, but let me give you guys, oh, I, can get, I can give you a life hack. You ready for the life hack? Yeah. The problem that, that guys have is we don't have a purse, right? Like, like a lot of women. I'm, I'm waiting. I, I need to back this. I'm going to get yelled at somehow. <laughs> Anybody can have a purse, I guess. Most Fanny of pack. the time, most of the time guys don't have purses. Fanny pack. And so... And I'm not wearing a fanny pack because I'm not Will Terry and live in a retirement community. <laughs> so the problem, the problem, the problem really is that that you got to carry two things, and they're big keys, mm-hmm. a bunch of keys, because you, as you age, you just get keys. That's what I've learned. And then so many keys, and then a, and then a big wallet, and and I've never liked it. And a so phone. Here's and a phone. So here's my hack. 
is if you if you guys go to the YouTube, you'll see this. I have a phone case uh -huh. that is my wallet. Hey, how did that pop out like that? Oh, it's got a, a little slot on the back. Yeah. And it's not a ton. I can keep five cards there. My driver's license, a couple of credit cards or whatever, and my insurance card. And I only have to grab my keys and my phone. And my phone's always with me anyway. And so it just stopped that whole like, okay, I got this. I got this. Oh, where's my wallet? Or where's no. the, you know, that's always something. <laughs> if you get the, uh, the Apple car when it comes out, you won't even need keys. You just use your no, phone. I'm waiting. I will buy it just for that. I hate carrying the keys around. I hate all that stuff. I'm but sure this you thing, can do that now with like a Tesla probably. Probably can. But this thing has been a lifesaver because when I had a wallet and phone, somehow I never lose my phone. I always lose my wallet. Mm. Same. Yeah. Well, now, <laughs> did you see the Apple little disc thing? Yes. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. I already read a review of it. That's going to be, that's, I'm, I'm going to be an early adopter there. Yeah. That's pretty although cool. Apple is a little bit late to the game. So I don't know if you can call yourself an early adopter because there's been like five <laughs> of those things. <laughs> they, I mean, Apple's never like the first one out of the gate for, for stuff like that. They, right. Like the headphones, you know, all of it. Yeah. Mm, right. I mean, maybe the iPhone was the iPhone the first, or was there? There were other smartphones. I mean, before. the BlackBerry was pre iPhone. Remember that? That was sort of the leader of that. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. But it's a good hack. I mean, if you if you're struggling with the wallet, I mean, this thing is. I'll give you guys a link. Mine has mine has cats on it, like falling cats. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we be done now? All right, let's be done. You can, but I don't wear a fanny pack. Just need to. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter because you you're the kind of person that would. So it doesn't matter whether you actually. I do. would rock it if I did. No. You would know it, and I would set a trend, and everyone would be wearing fanny packs. Again. But you can you've I, seen me at conventions. Well, I I wear a fanny pack on conventions and vacations. I, that's why I walk on the other aisle around you. Can I tell our audience my fanny pack story? <laughs> What's your fanny pack story? Unbelievable fanny pack story. There's only one time in life where I wear a fanny pack, and it's when I do an art fair. Oh, I know. And this you story. guys know this story, but yeah. So I was yeah. setting up an art fair in Seattle, just outside of Seattle, Anacortes, beautiful area. And I had done an art fair like two weeks before, <laughs> and I didn't clear out the, the you get a lot of cash sales at these at these art fairs and so i didn't clear it out and, and i also keep a bunch of cash in there too to give people change right mm -hmm. um so typically i keep like 200 bucks in there and that's just for change to give people but i had like three thousand dollars in there and uh, somebody came running up to me after i'd already been setting up and kind of walking around the the, the side of the show and they're like hey i found this you know they, they hand me like five dollar bill and they're like it fell out of your thing and i was like oh my god thank you and i looked down and it's just my, the fanny cap pack is empty and had $3,000 in it. Three grand had blown out on the ground. I never found any of it. Nobody turned it in. It was just like every now and again, I'll just be like, it's a sick sleep. feeling. Yeah. I think about it when I'm going to bed. Sometimes I'm like, who got that money? I, I hope they had a good time with it. I hope they had a good time with it. You know, it could have been <laughs> that you saved someone's life. Like, like yeah. maybe they would rent. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect, maybe I'll write a story about what happened to that money. Yeah. We needed it, Lee. So that was, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it's a good point, Will. There's nobody that was on site yet. The show was not open. These are not pedestrians coming through an art show. The show wasn't open yet. So chances are, it was an artist. Mm. We should have known the, to give it back to a fellow artist. Yeah, you can't steal from a fellow artist. It's like lame karma everywhere. But, you know... Did. We we did okay at the show and 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 made it back and it was no problem. But I would search YouTube for how to make money at art fairs, and, and uh, see. <laughs> just stand there and wait for three thousand dollars to blow by if you. Stand somewhere around here. Pretty soon, someone's going to drop something. But I will never wear a fanny pack again. Based was on it just that, it, you just zip, didn't zip it up. It was it was bad industrial design. There's two zippers. I zipped the wrong one. Oh, man. Well, Blame that's the not the fanny designer. pack's fault. It is, because yeah. they shouldn't have two zippers. Why have two zippers? Right I mean, there? that's not fanny packs in general fault. You can't fault all fanny packs because- All fanny packs. Fanny. That's a good- I have a good fanny pack. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. It's I do not want solid. it. If it's got a picture of Will Terry. It's a cool <laughs> fanny pack. It's made by, it's like a skater dude fanny pack. 
You'd love skater, it. Skater, skater will never. That, those two. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> a skater would never wear a fanny pack. I thought skaters <laughs> came up with fanny packs. Where'd they come up with hmm. in the first place? Fanny packs. I don't know. Will, where? <laughs> well, I, invented the, I invented the fanny pack. Okay. <laughs> I used to live in Germany. Dive on fanny packs today. The origin of the somebody can leave a comment if anyone's still listening on the origin of the fanny pack. I'd like to know what market this started. I, I'm thinking. I also like, wear socks with my burgers? sandals. Oh, that's a croc, a croc move. <laughs> socks and Crocs, baby. <laughs> with a fanny pack. <laughs> All right. Well, we've already ended this, so we don't even need to end it. We could just yep. go about our day working. Should we just leave this on and make this just like leave a five-hour podcast? I used to do that with stop. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs>